judge makes a decision for New York City retirees. We'll talk to Marianne Pizzatola and find out how he ruled on the temporary restraining order next as Labor's Week begins now. Hello, I'm Mark Harrison. New York City retirees were in court yesterday to argue for a temporary restraining order to prevent the city from switching their Medicare health coverage from traditional Medicare to privatized Medicare Advantage. We understand that Judge Lyle Frank has made a decision and here to give us the news is the president of the New York City Organization for Public Service Retirees, Marianne Pizzatola. Marianne, so good to see you again. Can you give us the latest and tell us what's new? Well, welcome for uh, thank you for having me back. Um, I'm glad to be here. So yes, we've had a lot uh, to report today. Uh, you are actually the first person I'm going to be telling this to and you and your audience. Uh, we had a court decision. So yesterday, you know, we were at court yesterday and the judge was to decide the temporary restraining order and stopping uh, the city from forcing us into Medicare Advantage plan and stripping away all of our choices and forcing us into this one plan. So he had to determine three things yesterday. He had to determine the restraining order, whether or not to approve it or deny it. And then there were two motions to intervene, one from this umbrella group of unions, the Municipal Labor Committee, and Aetna, the insurance company. The judge denied those two yesterday as being interveners, but granted them a Michi status, which means they could be friends of the court, um, which he did the last time. So it was expected and it was okay with us that they, that they did that. So those he denied, we read those decisions as we were, we were literally leaving the courthouse. This morning, we have the third decision. And that third decision is, is the judge granted the restraining order, uh, telling the city that they cannot implement this plan and that he believes on the merits of our case, of the briefs that we have filed, that we would be harmed by being forced into this plan. And so he granted the restraining order, stopping everything. That is really good news for you guys, and we appreciate you uh, making news on TLN this morning. That's, that is fantastic yeah. news. So you were up against some pretty big hitters. Uh, the Aetna attorneys were trying to get involved, MLC. What was that like in the courtroom? Did you feel a little outnumbered? Um, no, actually. <laughs> Um, it was kind of interesting because the Aetna attorney sat in front of me, as did the MLC attorney, and I was just being my kind of snarky self. The the gentleman that was for it was this was actually a kind of a funny story. So the Aetna, Aetna the vice president for Aetna sat in front of me, and I didn't know who he was. I never met him before, and so he knew me. So clearly, he's watching me. He's watching my channel. So he turned around. He introduced himself. He says, "Hi, I'm Rick Romeyer. I'm the vice president." of Aetna and I was like oh hi how you doing and he was standing up and he was jockeying from side to side and he said oh I had it my knees are killing me I just had a knee replacement did you ever have a knee replacement and I said no I said but I guess I should be concerned because you know if you have Aetna Medicare Advantage you probably had to go through prior authorization and he goes well actually I didn't and you don't and I said well really well if you needed skilled nursing or rehab you probably do and with that he sat down <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like he probably had to pay out of pocket because Aetna wouldn't cover it for him, right? You know, I learned a long time ago, Mark, I have to walk in here because I am dealing with Goliaths and I have to walk in like I own the damn room and, and I'm going to keep doing that. I think I'm confident in my team. I'm confident in my argument. I don't feel scared by the city. I'm angry by what they're doing. I'm angry by what my own unions are doing. To me, this is a destruction of the labor movement and everything that we built. And I think this is corporate greed with Aetna and other insurance companies trying to force people in a plan that if they had the ability to choose, they wouldn't choose it, so they have to force you into it. So I'm just gonna walk in there like I own the place and I'm gonna keep saying what I have to say and letting my legal team fight, fight the legal facts. Well. You're getting it right, Marianne. You're doing a very good job, and um, we love having you on. Um, you know, one of the first tactics that management will try during negotiations, during a union drive, is to divide and conquer. And do you feel as if we're trying to, if, if Aetna, if the city perhaps are both or separately trying to conquer the unions by separating the retired folks out from the unions and causing that conflict of interest? 
Absolutely, 100%. The unions are doing that. They've been doing it for the last two years. They sought to put in this messaging as it's to the unions. The Municipal Labor Committee's messaging to the union leaders was, it's either us or them. And it's even more telling is in the MLC's meeting just last week, uh, June 28th, or almost two weeks ago, um, the messaging that the, that the attorney that was there yesterday was saying to these union leaders, look, if the city has to pay for them, that's less than they're going to want to pay for us. That's not, should be, that should not be the messaging. Back in the days of labor, early labor, our labor leaders, the people who I looked up to, they would have said, no, 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 no. We earned this, we're going to keep this. And we need to, as a union body, as a labor body, as a labor committee, a coalition, go into the city and say, we are not going to allow you to divide us. We are not going to allow you to take away something we earned and paid for. You promised this, we're not walking it back, we're not diminishing it, we're not walking it down. And if the entire union committee stood together and said, we're not doing this, and you're not going to diminish what you're supposed to pay us, I'm not saying like be militant or whatever, but I mean, I think have a little bit more of a spine and push back than the way they are. I mean, I, I joked yesterday, I think some of these unions are in bed with management. I said, I think for Christmas, I'm gonna send them all satin sheets. This is not where we're supposed to be. <laughs> send them the inexpensive ones with the, uh, the, poly <laughs> the polyester in it. Make them sweat a little bit. You know, uh, <clears throat> do you feel that there's some greed involved here? A, a, a lot of times the best way to divide the unions is to get somebody saying, hey, you're going to make a little bit more. Is, is that what's going on? Hey, look, the retired people, they're getting old. They don't really matter. Can we sell them out and maybe get a little bit more in their pockets? Is that what's going on, do you think? Uh, it is, actually. The union, um, the leader, the attorney for the union leadership for the Municipal Labor Committee said, if the city has to pay for them that's less that they would give to us hmm. so they know right now unions do not represent retired persons we are not in their unions under the state Taylor law and New York City collective bargaining they cannot negotiate or collectively bargain and we are not in their union so they can't negotiate for us they're trying to say that while we are not union members and and the union leaders yesterday used to protect this population because they knew we were vulnerable it was not something you wanted to say out loud, but they forced us to keep saying it. You don't represent us and you don't bargain for us. Stop. But now they're realizing that for whatever messaging that the, the city is giving to them, the city's claiming they're broke or they don't have enough money. Um, Michael Mulgrew from the United Federation of Teachers literally went before a videotaped teacher meeting a year ago and said, the city said, if we give them back that 20% plan, referring to our Medigap plan that pays that 20% that Medicare doesn't, you give us back that 20% plan. We'll give you that money we would have spent on them and put it in your welfare fund. Now, that's a them and us. Let's take from them. Let's give them something what we think is equivalent to, but it's really inferior. It'll make them happy. Well, it makes us happy. And we'll just take what the city would have spent on those retirees and we'll use it for ourselves to keep ourselves at low cost or no cost. Now you're pitting active and retiree against each other. And you're selling it to the employees, to the union leaderships of today's unions, that if you don't do this, you're going to pay. And, Which is and, what's encouraging them to do it. Yeah. Divide and conquer, conquer. And is there any hope to, to, to help to, to think that the unions are going to going to see the light on this? Or uh, do you think that ship has sailed? You know, Mark, um, I, I read history. I love history. I love labor history. I love understanding how we got here. Um, one of the things Mayor Koch wrote in the New York Times uh, back somewhere late 70s was he was referring to Victor Gothbaum and he said Vic would cut your heart out if he knew that someone was harming his members in this situation I still consider retired labor a retired union member honorarium <laughs> and many of us are in retired organizations they should be protecting us and yet, where is my Victor Gottbaum of today to say, don't do this? I don't have that. I need to be able to teach them what their job should be. I need to find a way to do that because they're not listening and they haven't for two years. I'm concerned that they're not going to listen. Um, and I, 
I, I literally, I walk past Victor's picture I have on my wall every day and say, please tell me how, how to do this better because they need to understand where we came from and how we got here. We ran this city and we ran their unions. And this decision, what they're taking, this position is wrong. They should be pushing back on the city doing this to their retired workers and they should be angry about even being asked to do it. But they're not. Yeah. We're angry. What was uh, Mayor Cox Koch's favorite line. What was his tagline? Do you remember? I don't. How am I doing? Do you remember oh, that? Yes. Say it. Yes, because he was so. <laughs> How am I doing? You're doing everybody. great. You're doing great for everybody. At least he I think you are. I'm sure of him to ask people. I'm so glad you reminded me of that. <laughs> Which is why you didn't know it, because you're very sure of yourself. You're doing a great job with this thing. So here's where we are. Tell me where we are uh, going forward as far as the legal battle goes. So we have three legal battles in court right now. Um, this case, it was just a restraining order. The, the merits of this argument have to be argued. So this is case number three. We have the restraining order granted. The retirees don't have to do anything. They don't have to file a waiver. They don't have to file an opt out. Everything is literally paused. We coined a new word today. Our attorney, our lead attorney on this is Jake, um, Jake um, Gardner from Walden, Mockton, Harron. So we call this the Jake break. So every time we get these restraining orders, this is the Jake break. Um, so, so now this stops everything from happening. Um, and now the court has to schedule hearings uh to argue the merits of the rest of the case to determine is this a permanent injunction or you know is it eventually going to open back up so the other case is a class action copay case or we filed it to be a class action copay case this was when stemming from the first case when they imposed copays on our current medigap plans to try to make staying in this plan as painful as possible so you would want to go into the uh, the medicare advantage plan that they created the first time. That's our that's our case two. Case one was the original Supreme Court case that we filed to stop what almost very like much like the TRO today. We filed the TRO, granted that TRO. The city appealed, we won that. The merits of the case were argued, we won that case. And then the city appealed the appeal of the of the first department. Now it goes up to the New York State Court of Appeals, even though we had a unanimous decision, two courts affirmed. We are now waiting to see when that will be heard. And that's those are our three cases. And but we, we've won so far. Do we have any time frame? Do you have any feeling on when that's going to end up? Uh, so we could go into the fall on this, right? I believe it'll probably, this will probably, most of this should probably hash out in the next six months. Yeah. But because of the victory today, everybody's okay for now until we get a final yes. ruling there. And so now take the one hat off, put the other one on. Where are we legislatively in the city of, uh, in the city of New York? Oh, so I'm still meeting resistance. The same 12 council persons from the date that you were with us that the bill was introduced have been on it. We've had no new signers, although many of the council persons said, just get it introduced and we'll get on board. Um, some of the council persons are still insisting that we mitigate this through the courts and without them, which is very frustrating to me because we do know that and we keep telling them every single time we win in court, they then change the rules, play a different tactic, and they try to screw us again, but yet another way. This way, if they legislated a fix like they always did, then it would be fine. It wouldn't matter what the court eventual determination is, at least it's codified in law from the council, since the council legislated this. So now the game that they're playing is our bill, they're trying to say our two sentence bill is illegal because it violates collective bargaining and the Taylor law. But we have exposed just the other day, the municipal labor attorney saying, well, the bill doesn't violate the law by itself, but it could put financial pressure on the city because if the city has to pay for those retirees, they're not going to want to pay for us. That's why they're saying it violates it violates collective bargaining. It does not. Uh, but that's and their argument. It's, it's terrible to say, but this is sort of what we see happening also on a national level with so many things. We let the, the courts uh, play it out instead of having the politicians have the courage, shall we say, for lack of a, a better term to actually do something, to actually do their job. I agree with you 100%. And I think 
I think we've shown that if you can organize a group of retirees from the city of New York that are nationwide, today we have well over 26,000 people in our Facebook page. I have another over 15,000 people on our email list. We have, like, I think, another 7,500 people on our YouTube channel, plus our other social medias. We organized retirees. And if we could do that on this case, other retirees that are dealing with this same issue nationwide can do the same thing. My concern is this, we shouldn't have to be doing this. And this is the federal statute. Um, it was a, a, a law that I, as I understand, was, was implemented in 2000, December of 2000, and it allows for seamless transition of retirees into, that are in employer group plans, health plans, to be seamlessly transitioned into Medicare Advantage by their unions or former employer. This needs to stop. And this requires a rollback of that federal rule that allows the secretary of the country to waive these protections from the Medicare Act that allows every taxpaying American who's expected to be on Medicare when they got older or disabled would prevent them from being forced into privatized Medicare. We need to stop that. We need to reach out to our congressional um, elected officials and demand and that they roll back this rule. And, and that's what we're doing. July 25th, our organization, uh, in conjunction with another a sister group called PTPM, it's Protect Traditional Medicare, as well as uh, Be a Hero, AD Barkins group, are taking probably Amtrak trains and buses to DC to celebrate Medicare's birthday. And we are bringing attention to this issue. This has to stop. July 25th, we may come along for that one. We love watching you guys. I know you're trying to catch an airplane. We really, really appreciate you coming on this morning at the last minute and sharing the news. We're going to get this out to your folks as soon as we can. Mary Ann Pizzatola joining us this morning. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Thank you, Mark. Our thanks to Marianne for taking time from her very busy schedule to talk to us. Remember to like us and subscribe for all the latest on this fight and more for Labor This Week. I'm Mark Harrison, and I'll see you next week on Labor 